Should I share? <laughs> yeah, uh, hold on just a minute, Emily. Oh, and I'll, okay, oh, sorry. Never mind. Sorry, I'll no, stop. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> Uh, okay, so just to remind everyone, this is uh, this is our first seminar of the term, yay! Um, and uh, welcome back. Um, we have a full schedule. I think it's uh, completely packed. Is that right, Claire? Yeah. Uh, so um, look forward to all of you coming to to seminar at its usual time. Maybe in the fall, we'll even go back to having some of these um, in person. So, but. Emily was supposed to have come last year, so we um, we were. Uh, I think this is the is the one year anniversary of our virtual seminar, and uh, I did want to thank um, Claire and Yarn for having done such an excellent job this year in in making our our uh, our seminar uh, excellent. And uh, so today, I think we're going to continue in that vein with Emily Fisher. Um, Emily is a, an associate professor at Colorado State University, and her research has been really impactful in understanding broadly the role of nitrogen in atmospheric chemistry. Um, and she has done a huge amount of work on pushing forward the field in terms of its observational science and as well as uh, simulations. Um, she worked with folks at JPL, in fact, to, to really organize the first um, remote sensing measurements of one of the key constituents, PAN. Um, and that, that has really played a big role in uh, learning broadly about the role of, of uh, this mixed role of VOCs and, and NOx in the background atmosphere, and in particular, the role that uh, fire plays. And um, so we're going to hear all about that today with the, the seminar, and we can. But just a, another little bit of background, 2002, um, Bachelor's of Science in atmospheric, in atmospheric Science at UBC, and then a Master's at UNH, followed by 2010 PhD at University of Washington. And most recently, she was just awarded, uh, was it two years ago now, Emily, the the James McLean uh, Medal of the of the AGU. And so we're really pleased to have you uh, come and tell us about your research. I did want to take just one second more of your time here to uh, add um, that Emily has been a leader in uh, in pushing forward uh, our community to address the longstanding issues in gender and underrepresented um, voices in our field. And uh, we really appreciate all your efforts to um, improve the, the practices, the stuff you've done with um, social scientists to understand how, how we can uh, make our community work better for all the individuals is, has really played a big role in, uh, I think, in, in moving the field forward. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. And thanks for for coming with me on that journey, which I consider to be, you know, I'm dragging all sorts of people on that journey with me because that's one I want to go on. So I appreciate everybody who's who's with me on that. So, um, all right. So I'm going to talk to you about smoke. Um, I've had a number of different recent projects uh, in the last couple of years on wildfires. Um, I'll really focus on the We Can campaign. But first, I'm going to start with the story of that picture I just showed you. So this summer, um, this summer I was hiking with my kids uh, in just, just west of where I live. And we were sitting down after lunch and I noticed a, a plume rising up. And I looked at my husband and I looked at those kids and I said, we have to go now. I made a split second decision to run out uh, the way we came in. And we were okay, uh, but that fire ended up being the Cameron Peak Fire, which was the largest wildfire in Colorado's recorded history, reached over 200,000 acres, in, and it, the pictures that I'm showing here I took August 13th, and it was still burning um, near my birthday in mid-October. So that acreage for perspective is 25% of the state of Rhode Island, that's where I'm from, and I looked up fires that matter for your community <laughs> just before this seminar. 
It's about double the 2020 Bobcat fire in terms of size. So it burned basically for two months all the way from the Continental Divide down basically until it became fuel limited um, in the Front Range. So that fire was the story for two months um, in Colorado and then the East Troublesome Fire hit. And the East Troublesome Fire started west of the Continental Divide. That's the fire that was in the news that jumped the Continental Divide going into Estes Park and they had to evacuate Rocky Mountain National Park because of it. So these are just some pictures from the summer. I'm sure many of you have similar ones, right? Pieces of leaves and you know, just smoke, uh, uh, particulate matter uh, and ash in the little water, right? And every run that I would take, I'd be like, there's a bloom and post it on Strava for my uncle. It's, that's how we really communicate. Um, and this, this plume, right, it changed the light, it changed everything about where I, where I was. Um, so 2020 fire season was just part of my fire journey over the last five years. I've been thinking a lot about fires um, I think I like to study things that I can see and that seem really important and big and fires to me is one of those things. And so I've been working with this fantastic group of students over the last five years to really learn as much as I can personally about fires. And so I'm going to use some of this material as intro and then we'll talk about the We Can campaign. But I know this is a really broad audience, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about fires generally. Um, I'll present work from these students. Um, Steve Bry worked on fires and climate. Um, Jacob uh, was the lead student on the weekend campaign. Julieta and Kate have done some analysis of, of that data um, following. And so I'm very lucky uh, for these people. We've together learned a lot about fires. So let's start really broad. Um, I don't really have to convince you of the importance of fires, I feel like, when I talk to a California audience, right? But, but I still think it's good to look at this national picture, right? So this is um, the FPA FOD data set. It documents you know, almost 2 million US wildfires. What's shown here is between 1992 and 2015, so it doesn't encompass the most recent years. Um, if you look at the Western US, right, the dots here are by ignition type. This is where fires typically um, wildfires typically occur in the Western US, right? There's very, there's many different ecosystems covered here. In the Western US, most of our fires um, in terms of burn area, and that's really critical, burn area instead of fire number in, in terms of fire impact. Um, most of the fires in the West are lightning ignited. Um, they're very different than fires in the East, right? Which are much shorter lived, fires um, that are often started by humans. Those large fires, like the one that you experienced last year, Bobcat, sorry, I think it's called Bobcat now that I've moved on that slide. The one that I, I've experienced this summer in Colorado, those large wildfires account for most of the burn area in the US West. And we can, we, as I'm gonna show you shortly, we sampled the big fires, right? And so um, if you look, this is percent of total burn area for those two boxes and fire sizes on this axis, the Cameron Peak fire, um, is, is right about here, right? So it's one of the bigger fires. And typically those, um, uh, you know, 70% of our burn area is lightning ignited, they're about 30% is human ignited. And these little fires really don't matter in the West. They're something, you know, they're less than 10% of the tonal burn area. Totally different picture in the Eastern US. Um, these big Western US wildfires appear to be increasing in frequency. Um, and so this is a, just a classic paper from Anthony Westerling. Um, these are the number of fires greater than 400 hectares. Um, and the trend that's been, um, that's in this data, right, is the equivalent of 20 more additional large fires per decade. That's what's in the, that's um, how you, you know, can think about what's happened recently. Um, my student, Steve, and I won't show this here, right, expects this to continue, right? The, the reason fire, we care so much about the fires from an air quality perspective right now is that um, there's a strong link to aridity and most climate models predict an increase in aridity in the Western US. And so anywhere where aridity is important for modulating year to year fire variability, if everything else stays the same, then we're going to expect more large wildfire years. So 
the smoke from these large Western US wildfires blankets the US during severe wildfire seasons such as 2020. And I'll talk a little bit about this maybe when I recall we can, but I really got an appreciation for this doing field work in 2018. There are ribbons of smoke throughout the atmosphere all the time, <laughs> throughout the free troposphere all the time if you fly around the West. You can see them on LIDAR, they're everywhere. And so what this picture is just showing is um, the air quality monitoring sites at the, the colors here represent the AQI, which goes from green, right? It's their air quality yardstick. It goes from green is good all the way up to you know red and purple, which is unhealthy and then um, for sensitive groups and then unhealthy, right? And so these California wildfires, they're not just an issue for California. They're definitely an issue for Colorado. We often have your smoke here in the front range. It comes, tends to come, not necessarily from down here, but definitely the Northern California fires tends to wrap up and then come down into the front range. And in summer 2020, that added on to local smoke that we had. But these plumes extend quite far, right? They tend to, they extend and, you know, eventually they'll hit the news on the East Coast and they'll say, we have some haze and it's actually fires. So the smoke exposure in the Western US is impacting both extreme and mean PM 2.5. So we've sort of reached that stage of, of the impact of PM. There's a nice work that was done out of Dan Jaffe's group showing a positive trend in the 98th quantile of fine particulate matter due to wildfire activity. And my, my student, Kate, um, has also tried to estimate the average annual smoke exposure in terms of PM 2.5, and then what extreme years like 2018, what we think the future looks like, um, what that means. So in the Pacific Northwest, this is probably at its worst in terms of surface air quality impacts in terms of PM 2.5. Um, and in those kinds of years, smoke is contributing two to nine micrograms per meter cubed of summer, summer mean PM 2.5. And that's 70% of the PM 2.5 in high fire years. So it's quite a large contribution. This is becoming a policy issue. Um, it already is a policy issue. Um, this is a nice, paper by Liji David, who is, um, was a postdoc with Ravi. Uh, and so what she did was add up all the exceptional event days in the US. So all the days where um, a location has exceeded an air quality standard, but, but for a reason that's not controllable in that area. And so, and she did that for ozone, um, fine particulate, and then coarse particulates. Um, and then she attributed the cause of that. And you can see a lot of red here. So wildland fires are causing um, us to exceed air quality limits, right? And so, yes, we can flag that and say it's not controllable, but there's still the public health issue. Um, and then, you know, the impact of smoke on human health is spanning the U.S. I think we tend to think of this as a Western U.S. issue, but, but our, my student Kate has been working on a health impact analysis of smoke. And so she's been looking at total PM mortalities by state and then smoke attributed mortalities. And if you think about how you get mortality, you multiply in a very coarse way, the total PM by the number of people, right? So if you have a little bit of smoke impacting a really big population center, then you will have impacts on those people. And so we need to think about smoke, not just as a, you know, an issue for the Western US, but as, as this travels East where there are higher populations, in general outside of California, um, you know, when smoke comes to Texas, when it comes to New York, this is an issue for people. So um, smoke is interesting to me too, not just as an air quality issue, it's interesting from a larger atmospheric perspective. So um, this is an example, this map shows the average days per month with a NOAA hazard mapping system smoke plume overhead. So those gray plumes that I had on that first map, so on average in summer, you know, there in a summer month on average over the Midwest, a third of the time there's smoke in the air somewhere. And so um, I have a new student who, you know, is looking to see, does this matter for light at the surface is, and I think what well, this is going to be a fascinating, we'll see what she finds, but, but is the diffuse fraction of PAR changing at the surface sufficiently that that's giving a boost to agriculture in the Midwest? There's just so much smoke everywhere in our atmosphere during the growing season. And so, um, so anyway, with all of this sort of background in mind, um, 
we led we can and so um, this is a large effort to sample smoke plumes um, I had a really, really wonderful, wonderful team across five different universities. Um, it was conducted with, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, with the NSF NCAR C-130 aircraft. We based in Boise in summer 2018, which if you remember was quite a big fire season as well, similar to 2020 in terms of its fire activity. Um, and we flew all around the West and we sampled as many different smoke plumes as possible. Um, and so I'm gonna, talk to you about that. Um, and there's Jacob and I in our in our team picture. Um, I have this structure to try to give you a broad view of the campaign. I'll talk mostly about the work done in my group and some of the other groups who are working on the reactive nitrogen piece of the smoke, but um, there's lots of other fun work happening too. So hopefully I've convinced you with my intro <laughs> that understanding wildfire smoke is critical for air quality, nutrient cycles, climate, and weather. Um, over North America, for sure. Um, so we can focus on three topics. So the first one was fixed nitrogen emissions and evolution. That's um, part of the, of uh, that's sort of my hook into this based on my other work. Um, but there are three, two other topics. One is the evolution of aerosol optical properties. And the second one is cloud activation and chemistry and wildfire. Oh, oh. do I just keep going? Yeah, go 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 ahead, Emily. Sorry about that. Um, it's okay. It's no problem. I, I know, that that sounded pretty bad. I'll see if I can see what's going on. Yeah, I don't know either. Should I keep going though? You think so, Paul? Yeah, please go ahead. I'll I'll see if I can learn if there's a bigger okay. issue. Thanks. Okay. Um. Okay. <laughs> keep on rolling. All right. So so. Why this focus? So there are some logistical um, constraints that made this focus make sense to combine because it turns out the airplane can only go one place, right? And your payload all has to work together. Um, but if you think about fixed nitrogen emissions and evolution, this is central um, to within plume radicals. This is what you need to understand downwind oxidant production um, and the eventual nitrogen that's deposited to ecosystems, which is an issue for high altitude ecosystems in the Western US. Um, smoke is radiatively important and it's everywhere over North America in summer. Um, and then because the smoke is everywhere, right, it is interacting with clouds. Um, clouds process gases and particles, they contribute to new particle mass and removal. And then as we learned during we can also, smoke contains CCN and ice nucleation, um, ice nucleating particles. So this, with these three, threads in mind, we designed the payload. And so I'm gonna from here forward, really focus on the fixed nitrogen emissions and evolution. And let, I'm gonna talk about what we did in the campaign and then what we've learned, what we've learned there. Um, it's, WeCan is not unique um, in the way that we're the first people to study wildfire smoke. There's been be a beautiful history of work done, particularly by Bob Yokelson on sampling um, wildfire smoke plumes. And they've been intercepted in many other very large NASA NOAA missions with aircraft, right? It's hard for people to avoid them. ATOM intercept, for example, I know there's grad students who are involved in this, right? Like intercepted wildfire uh, smoke plumes. But what's unique about WeCan is the comprehensiveness of the payload with respect to the, the nitrogen budget. So, um, so focusing in on that nitrogen, right? We measured NOx, um, ammonia, PANS, nitric acid, HONO, and number of reduced species. There's also aerosol composition. And we worked really hard to um, make a pretty, as bulletproof as possible, VOC set of measurements. So there's both a one second measurement um, with the PTR TOF that Lou Hu's group uh, brought and TOGA, um, so there's a two minute uh, GC mass spec measurement of 50 to 60 VOCs. And then there's uh, canister samples that I could trigger basically at exactly the time that we wanted to trigger a sample. And so because of that, we're able to see a big picture, see the complete picture of nitrogen emissions and evolution, I think in a way that we haven't been able to see it yet. So I won't spend time on this, but my group did the ammonia measurements. We had never measured ammonia before. Um, 
Alana did a great job. We bought a new QC tildes and operated it with active pass, continuous active passivation. Um, and so that was um, pretty exciting. So those instruments went into the C-130. We completely stuffed the C-130. I didn't know when I designed this that this was gonna be the most uh, complicated atmospheric chemistry payload to ever fly on the C-130 as it turns out. But I only had to let go of one thing and that was NOI. Out of everything I wanted to put on the plane, I had to let go of one thing. Um, for those of graduate students who have never seen the C-130, this is what it looks like from the back. There's me and Frank, uh, head of a flight. Um, this is what it looks like from the front. There's Joel Thornton's graduate students there. Um, and we based in Boise and uh, Boise was chosen for a number of reasons. Um, it's pretty central, right? And so from Boise, you can reach almost this whole map. The flight time for the C-130 with that load during summer temperatures was about six and a half hours. So basically I could go almost anywhere, right? To go over to Oregon, for example, go to Oregon, takes an hour and 45 minutes, play around for three and a hours-ish, and then fly back. Um, we ended up sampling more than 20 fires. When we would approach a fire, we would do the same thing. I was very particular about flight patterns. We would fly out, we would fly behind it to get the air that was the plume was injecting into. Um, we would then circle around in front of the fire, so where the outflow was going. Most, many of the large fires, for like the car fire, for example, this one made tornadoes the day that we um, flew that. So these are big. They're being actively fought, a lot of them, and they have a temporary flight restricted area around them. So we would often be above the firefighting efforts, and we would turn into the smoke as soon as it was either allowed or the pilots felt safe. So many of the fires were not being fought. I was able to catch some, and then we could go a little bit sooner. And then we would sort of sample downwind like a lawn mower or a snow shoveling, depending on your season, like back and forth. And I would try to time our, as much as I could calculate with the wind, the wind speeds, I would try to calculate to try to pseudo Lagrangian, let's say, the same air um, downwind. So the, the weekend data set is particularly strong in the 30 minutes to four hours of chemical evolution. Then when I would come back from like a fire, I would on the way back, I would look up and down on the LIDAR and I would try to move the plane into some kind of old smoke because there's old smoke everywhere. So I could see it on the LIDAR and I would talk to the LIDAR operator and then I would talk to the pilots and be like, how, how high do you think it is? Okay, can we move? Can you request? Can we go back? And we try to move into old smoke and follow that back to Boise. So we ended up with a library of both fresh smoke that's been really carefully aged and characterized. And then this library of old smoke that we have a lot of random samples of um, from across the West. So I would take off in the afternoon and then we come back early evening. So this is when fires are really um, rapidly growing. It's also the time when you can get a plane like the C-130 into smoke because you have to say between one and 2000 feet above the nearest obstacle if you can't see and we often couldn't see. Um, we sampled a variety of different fuel types across the West, and I have a partnership with some folks at the um, uh, Forest Service to help us understand the fuels. So we, these smoke cloud mixtures, we have five different samples of smoke cloud mixtures that are really quite fascinating. Um, that was the hardest logistics to manage because um, we were set up to sample um, warm clouds, not ice clouds. So I would look on goes in real time and say, okay, that looks like smoke and clouds are interacting, but then often I would get there and they would be ice, which I think there's actually some science to be done with that, <laughs> that observation. But, um, but uh, we were successful doing that. I was successful with those logistics five times. And um, what I would do is come sample the smoke, then go up into the clouds and then tell the pilots to just hit the clouds. And so we were collecting cloud water and we were also um, sampling cloud drop residuals. And then we would go down and sample the smoke again. Um, we did two air quality focused flights. One was down into the Central Valley, um, a bunch of missed approaches. When the Central Valley was filled with smoke, it looked like this. Um, and then a river of smoke from California to Idaho of like aged smoke. So I would like take a bunch of legs in and out of military air spaces in here. We went in and out of Boise so many times and Boise is impacted by smoke. So we're starting to figure out how the composition in Boise changes in and out of smoke. So 
that's the campaign. Now let's talk about the data. So um, this is a schematic of fixed nitrogen. Um, and it's not fully complete, I would say, actually, now that I know this. But, um, but when you think about nitrogen and smoke plumes, you have to remember that you can't do a really perfect budget because a lot of the nitrogen is N2, and we didn't measure that. But we did measure pretty much everything else here. Um, and so um, I'm going to talk to you about first about the um, emissions. So um, what fraction of this fixed or reactive nitrogen is in an oxidized form? So NO or HONO. Um, versus a more reduced form? That's question one on, from the WECAN science team. And that's important, right? Because as we learned during WECAN, right, HONO is a source of OH when photolyzed. And so as it turns out, I think this is absolutely critical for understanding chemistry in wildfire plumes. Um, we need to understand this chemistry um, and the timescales of it to understand ozone production in plumes. Right, and then um, and then we need to understand these relative um, amounts here to understand ammonium nitrate formation and um, deposition to ecosystems. So when we this is how I'm going to show you the data parsed. So when we would approach a fire, right? I said we go behind it and then we zip 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 zip, zip back and forth, and the plume right here is in the center. And you can color this by the number of times we pass through the plume. Every time you pass through a plume, it's super obvious chemistry-wise. It's, you know, your carbon monoxide jumps up really high, right? So this is about 5,000 ppb when we're going in these plumes. It smells like smoke. There's no doubt that you're in a, you're in a wildfire smoke plume, right? And the ammonia um, in blue here, right, as an example, trace pops up. So everything I'm going to show you now is just in these individual segments. So what fraction is um, reduced versus oxidized? So these are all the individual fires that we sampled during weekend. There's A's and B's if we came back more than 30 minutes later. I'm considering it a different fire. Um, and then here in the colors are the species that we measured. Um, we, ammonia is at the top in red as a reduced species. And then we go down to the more oxidized species in blues. This, um, what's shown here is the NEMR. So this is the enhancement in that species divided by the enhancement in carbon monoxide. So it's corrected for dilution. Um, and so this is the total, and then this is it as a percent. So if you have no idea what's going on in the seminar, at least you can say that's a lot of red on this slide. And so one major thing that we learned during WECAN is that um, the majority of the nitrogen in these smoke plumes, even in these big, big fires that are growing really rapidly in the hot afternoons, is reduced. So, um, and it ranges from around 50% to 85%. There are some exceptions here, but this was surprising to me because sort of our view of this from lab studies and other work, right, is that is that as you have more smoldering conditions, you have more ammonia. And if you have more flaming conditions, you have more NOx. And that's the way I went into this campaign thinking about it. Um, but then these fires are actually many little fires in one big fire. And what is getting pulled up in these large plumes has a lot of ammonia in it. Um, there are some exceptions. Taylor Creek was a very different fire plume. I still do not understand this fire. It also had a lot of SO2 a lot of sulfate very quickly formed in this fire plume. It also had a lot of HONO. So it was one of our, um, I think probably had the highest OH of our, of our smoke plumes. But this is one of the, this is one of our um, sort of big findings of WECAN is, is what's the form of this now that you can see the, the full picture. Um, I should say one more thing while I'm here. These passes or these transects through the plumes um, you might think from that schematic, I wouldn't need to have all these species on here. But even in the first 30 minutes to an hour, 
the chemistry has changed so much. It's, it's going so fast. So even in these first um, transects that are, you know, 30 minutes to, to an hour, there's already quite a bit of pan formation happening. There's um, particulate nitrate um, and Hono, you know, is decaying pretty rapidly, I think. So when we compare the emissions to what's been done in the lab, um, this is what we get. So what we did here was take, um, we calculated an emission factor from our data. So, and to get that, we made a few assumptions. We assume that 45% um, of the fuel is carbon. We um, do some conversions here. And then we, you know, assume that, um, uh, that our CO, CO2 and methane um, is most of our, our carbon. So, so you end up with a, a gram ammonia per kilogram of fuel burned. And that can be compared to a lab study where they might know exactly how much they burned of something. Um, and so here, this is WeCan um, data in green. And this is just our gas phase ammonia. And this is our NHX, so particulate ammonium plus the ammonia. And you can see that green and blue overlap. So we're, um, though there's a large range where the weekend is pretty in line with um, the lab-based studies. What was unexpected, right? So here's ammonia up here and here's NOx. Here, the green largely is falling below the blues. And so I, I think that weekend is also telling us is that the NOx emission factors for these very large plumes might be lower um, than the what you would get um, from some of the lab studies. I'm not exactly sure why, but I have no reason to doubt our NOx, our NOx measurements. Um, and this is also even in these very, very large fires. Okay, so how does this change with time? How does this uh, big picture evolve? So let me point out just some key species here for the non-atmospheric chemists. Um, so I showed you a little bit about NO and ammonia. Um, what's of interest to me are the, the pan species. That's where I've done quite a bit of work in the past. These species are interesting because they can serve as a, a reservoir for NOx. And so at high temperatures, this thermal equilibrium favors NO2 and at lower temperatures, um, it the other direction. So um, what I'm gonna show you next is going to be all the passes averaged of all the fires for a summary of all these species. And that's this. So here is physical age on this bottom part. So here's less than one hour, one to two hours, two to three hours, and up to five to six hours. Given the flight constraints, I have way more points. It's only 34, but it's a lot of points actually for fire sampling. Um, 34 samples of plumes less than one hour old and only eight samples of plumes five to six hours old. So the strength of this data set is over here in this, in this one to four hours. These are the different um, species that were, were measured during WeCan. So here's um, NO and NO2 are in green. Um, HONO is here in red, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, purple is particulate nitrate, which is from uh, aerosol mass spec, and we, so we don't know if that's um, inorganic or organic. Um, the PANs are down here in blue. Um, PAN and PPN were the only PANs that were quantified. Um, the gas, this orange. So the gas phase organic nitrogen containing species were measured by the ISIMS that were, was run by Joel Thornton's group at the University of Washington. And this orange um, is any species containing nitrogen, um, two or more carbon atoms uh, and three or more oxygen atoms. So that's what orange is. Um, and then NVOCs, um, is any non-nitrate oxidized nitrogen containing VOC that could be measured by the PTR. Those don't really change with time, that orange, that light orange. So that's how this chemistry evolves 
um, in these uh, first few hours. And now I'm gonna show you some of the interesting pieces of this. So what you can see first is the red disappears. This over here, this little increase, I don't actually think um, is important. There's, it's not that many samples and is a little bit random. But what you see here is this, this, this dramatic increase in HONO. Um, what uh, Joel's group has found is that um, by calculating the Hawks production rate um, via multiple pathways, um, they've showed that in these really young plumes, so you know, half an hour to one and a half hours old, honophotolysis is the dominant source of OH. Um, when I wrote the proposal, I didn't actually even put this in. We didn't put this in as a hypothesis because there was too much back and forth in the literature. And I thought, oh, if we get one of these people as a reviewer, they're not gonna like it. But then as soon as we <laughs> saw these measurements, I was like, Joel, we need, you need to write a HONO paper. Um, and so HONO is the, is the dominant source of OH, I'm pretty convinced, and then um, followed by the uh, photolysis of, of formaldehyde. So um, purple, let's talk about purple. So is this um, ammonium nitrate? What is this? What is purple? So what we've, what we've done to try to sort that out, um, is to try to look really, really carefully um, at the thermodynamics of possible ammonium nitrate formation. Um, and so what Jacob did was take all of our plumes and look at them in this altitude on this axis, um, and then the partial pressure of nitric acid and ammonia divided by um, Kp. And so, um, when you are on this side, that would be favored. And when you're on this side, um, that would not. And so what we're finding is that that formation is pretty much um, only favorable in fresh dense plumes injected into the higher troposphere, which is what's happening with these, with, with, um, with these large plumes. And so what Jacob has done is sort of mapped out, mapped out that space. Um, if we go back here and we go back here to the blue, this is where I'm really interested. So um, pan formation is really, really rapid in these plumes. The, the NO2 is getting locked up in pan quite dramatically um, and quite quickly over this one to four hour time range. When you move out to longer than that, so if I look at plumes that are older than that, um, the percent contribution of PAN to NOI or the um, PAN enhancement relative to carbon monoxide seems relatively stable. Because the, what's happening, I think, is it's getting formed really rapidly. The plumes are kind of evening out at an altitude with a relatively constant temperature. And then you have um, things staying relatively steady. You see the same thing actually for ozone in the near, in the near source. So a rapid increase in ozone and then um, uh, no distinguishable change in delta ozone, delta CO with time. So um, I, I don't show this today, but the dominant uh, precursor is acetaldehyde probably um, with biacetyl as another uh, precursor that's important. What's really exciting is that that pan formation rate, we can also see from space, <laughs> which I never thought was going to be possible. Um, and so what Julieta has been doing is um, looking at maps of pan and carbon monoxide from CRIS, um, which is a sensor on SWOMI NPP. Um, and so here is an example of a day in September. So this is when we were doing the educational flights for weekend after the main campaign had ended. And this fire, um, this Pole Creek fire popped up in Utah. And what was really nice about this fire plume was it started early in the day. So we got to see a pretty extended plume by the time the satellite came over at 1.30 in the afternoon. And 
it's a relatively clean background. So for much of the summer, there was so much smoke everywhere that from satellite, though you can see the plumes, you're not having a real clean background. But by September, there weren't as many fire plumes and especially down here. And so this plume was injected into a really relatively clean atmosphere. So if you zoom in on that, which is what she's done here, and you can calculate an enhancement in pan relative to enhancement in carbon monoxide for the column, because this, sense, this satellite has a CO and a pan product. Um, and you can look that here's the fire. And as you go downwind, you see blue to red, which is an increase in dilution corrected pan. So that's the, that's the chemistry proceeding in one satellite overpass, really, because this plume edge out here is about three hours old, and this is very fresh. So you can compare to the kind of plot I just showed you for all the species, we can do that just for pan. And so if we do that and we line up and we say, we run a bunch of trajectories and we say, how old is it here? How old is it here? How old is it here? Um, we can map this plume from satellite to physical age. And then these are the 17 weekend smoke plumes that I had on the last plot. And you can see that the satellite, whoops, the satellite is showing the same growth rate as we observed across you know, 20 really carefully sampled plumes during weekend. So I'm super excited that we can extend some of these nitrogen related findings from weekend into a much broader view using satellite observations based on this. We can do a very similar plot for ammonia from Chris, um, but that paper is not, um, this, the, this paper that we submitted just has pan in it. So this library, so if you have some need to know about old smoke, I have a library that you can check out. Um, so what Kate did has done, and we can easily share with the weekend um, in the weekend data set is every time we encountered smoke in the Western US, um, Kate classified how old she thinks it is. <laughs> and so basically what she did was say, so the young smoke's relatively easy. We often knew where the fire was. I showed you that data already. But there, you know, we would have enhanced 3-methylfuran, which has a lifetime of, of about three hours compared to the background, in addition to elevated HCN and CO fire tracers with long lifetimes. Um, medium smoke um, would not have elevated 3-methylfuran, but would have furan elevated. And then walking down to older smoke um, would no longer have elevated furan. Um, the oldest smoke would have elevated HCN and CN only. So we have now this library of samples. Um, and what we've been doing with that most recently, in addition to looking at the nitrogen partitioning in it, um, has been to look at the HAPs. Because I've been getting tons of questions about, well, if PM 2.5 is elevated when smoke comes to town, what else is in that smoke and does it matter? And so, what we've done is take our HAPs to PM ratios in the WECAN fire plumes, and we had to you know, estimate PM mass based on the AMS um, and the SP2. But we're then, then ratioing the HAPs to that. And so um, what Kate has done has been able to show, she, what she's been able to show is that the health risk of gas-based HAPs in smoke plumes per PM mass drops with time in general. Um, and the species that are most important for us to pay attention to if we wanna measure in surface air quality networks, the ones that we should pay attention to would be acrolin, formaldehyde, benzene, and HCN. Those are likely the dominant contributors to gas-based HAPs risk, risk when smoke comes to town. However, this is probably still pretty small compared to the risk of PM. But those are the species probably that, that we should quantify. Um, all right, let me wrap up so I can leave time for questions. So looking ahead, um, my group is going to continue working on smoke, but I think less in some ways from an atmospheric chemistry perspective. So after this summer, I've just gotten so many questions about what should I do? Right, so many questions. And so I, what I'm doing next, hopefully, is working with a, a large team um, 
largely at CSU to try to figure out how we communicate about smoke more effectively. How do we use our low cost sensors to communicate um, and so that people with um, anywhere from a high locus of control, so somebody like me who can filter their air and stay home and keep their kids inside to someone with a more lower locus of control, all, you know, to, who maybe works outside and can't just go inside when smoke comes to town to someone who's experiencing homelessness, what should they do, right? And so I, that's sort of the next space that I wanna help lead is how we manage smoke communication. How do we work with communication specialists and um, our epi community um, and our, um, our health community to, to help make the communication as, as, as good as possible. Um, and then I'm really interested in thinking about what the impacts on agriculture might be. That's something that I find fascinating, this changing of light at the surface. So thanks for having me. Um, just some things that if might be fun. Uh, this, I got to do a Nova Now podcast and the person after me is a, is a doctor and the person after that talks about masks. And so it's a, it's a fun podcast all about smoke from a lot of different angles um, and touches a little bit on COVID-19. And then NCAR did a bunch of education stuff around WeCan. And so there's, um, there's a bunch of videos. So if that's interesting, there's a bunch of two to three minute videos of like flying on WeCan, the op center, what the grad students were doing, that kind of stuff. It, it's fun. Those are kind of fun. Um, and then I talked about a little bit about this with the grad students. Um, I have this new initiative focused on educating moms about climate change. And I, you know, that's uh, my involvement of that for sure has stemmed from the extreme fire seasons of 2018 and 2020. Um, so that's it. What do you want to talk about? Thank you so much, Emily, for a really great, uh, really great seminar. So um, questions, let's see, anybody have a question for Emily? Just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Lily. Hi. Um, I was wondering if there was a correlation, I, I actually missed, um, first off, what your like altitude profile looked like, but I was wondering yeah. if there's a correlation between the age of smoke um, mm -hmm. and the altitude, and if so, what that looked like. Uh, no, I couldn't give you something like that. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, the we can't, I'll answer it in sort of a, a different way, but give you a little bit of more information about the altitude. Cool. So, um, in general, these plumes were um, more, let's say, more than 2,000 feet above ground level because we were flying in um, instrumented flight rules because when we would go into the plumes, we couldn't see anything. So what I would do was request a box. So I'd fly around and I would get a sense of the rough altitude and then I would request a box and I would have to stay in that air box, right? Because I, nobody can see each other. So you don't want planes to crash. So my altitude is generally high. I'm generally sampling large plumes, generally high. Um, there are more boundary layer flights of aged smoke because I could catch them on the way home in a relaxed manner in the middle of nowhere. Where, where we could see just enough that we could fly visually. So I can't give you like, I don't have a random sample is what I'm saying of altitude, <laughs> but we can separate by altitude and we do see chemical differences by altitude. So, you know, for example, things that you would expect at higher altitudes, the relative contribution of PAN to the total oxidized nitrogen budget is higher mm -hmm. for sure. So I can see those things in our data set that we have, but I have, fewer samples at lower altitudes. Thank you. Um, others, anyone have a question for Emily? This is Rick, Rick Plagan. Yeah, go ahead, Rick, you're, you're muted though. Oh, you muted yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm intrigued by the data on the ammonia and the nitriles. The, the hydrogen cyanide and, and, the, yeah. and the nitriles that, that you saw. And wonder whether you have any information as to the variation in the nitrogen content of the fuel in the different fires that you looked at. <laughs> I don't. 
I have a little bit. I have a little bit. I, I'm not going to say I don't, but I've actually had a pretty hard time um, figuring out the right way to do this. So, um, okay, let me go back to that fuel map, right? So if you have ideas on how we would add this up appropriately, I would love to hear them because I don't know for a given, like for a given location, what I would do is I would call, I, I would finish the flight and I would document in my spreadsheet for Roger, Andy and Joe, I would say at this time, I was at this fire sampling exactly during this time. And then they would go back to the fire maps um, and um, they would produce, they have produced for us this, um, percent basically of things that have burned in these different ecosystem types. So they'll be like, you know, just an example, 70% birch, like 20% sage or whatever, like something like that. Right. So then to compare, so, but I don't know how to add up nitrogen within that to take it to a, a next step. Okay, I don't, I don't know that either. But what I do know is a little bit about what happens to nitrogen, organically bound nitrogen when fuels burn. And then the nitrogen, a, typically, if you're talking about fossil fuel combustion, a third of the nitrogen will be emitted as nitrogen oxides. You will see some nitriles, you will see some ammonia. That's relatively well mixed combustion, generally. More poorly mixed the combustion is, the more that may be re reduced to other species because you've got the initial reactions taking place in a reducing atmosphere. Yeah. So I'd be happy to talk with you offline about some ancient history that might point to ways to think about <laughs> I'd be willing to engage with ancient history because, you know, <laughs> Jacob and I really mapped this all out, had some good discussions with Jim Roberts, and I was like, nah, I can make some things here, but I don't know how to do this very well in this setting. I, in some ways, I'm like, that's for the lab to do, but I agree with you, the burn conditions, when you think of a fire this size, are just very uh, heterogeneous. And, 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 and understanding a little bit about what's going on when these fuels are burning might, might give you clues as to the differences between the lab. Well, the what I would love for it to give me clues about is this. This Taylor Creek fire, what happened? Why is that mixture so different? And Beaver Creek also has very different um, ratios. And I, I really have no idea why, because they're not unique by my look at fuel types in any way. We should so talk offline. Yeah. All right. Other questions? Anything else? Well, I'll ask one, Emily, about Pan. Um, you know, it's interesting in that that figure you showed of the of the Chris um, pan comparison to the um, yeah uh, where was it there yeah. yeah beautiful I mean it's really amazing to see that you can do this from I had no idea I did not propose yeah. this I didn't know like Julieta was like look and I was like what <laughs> yeah no it's it's amazing that I mean Chris is amazing right and the, it's amazing it's just it's amazing, yeah. Yeah, but but then I, you know, you think about this again, and right, Chris's averaging kernel, of course, is peaked at higher altitudes, right? Yes. It, um, if the if the pan is near the surface, you don't see it at all, right? And yep. so I, you know, I I think right, one of the key parts of all of this in terms of its air quality impacts is when this stuff comes down, um, the pan decomposes, and now now we can uh, have pretty efficient oxidant production, yes. right? Because we've got yep. a lot of of NOx released, and so I keep I keep thinking about you know at some level this this these observations from Chris and so forth they really do give us that near field context at the altitude of the detrained plume. But what is your thinking about the the next step where this stuff comes down, and and what happens in terms of the oxidation chemistry? I've been trying to think about how to think about this. Um, I can show you where I am. I'm not sure if it's useful or not. I'll say, I'll show you where I, I have an extra slide that I'm thinking about how we get at this. Yeah. So for using Chris, I'm not sure. 
you know, that's when I talk to Vivian Payne, right, and Susan Kulowick, they're like, get us to ozone, get us to ozone. And I'm like, well, I don't know if Chris can get us to ozone. I think Chris can get us to a budget of how much pan is in the Western US that is attributable to fires. I think Chris could probably get us there. Um, and then from there, we could assume an ozone production efficiency and we could do an ozone budget that way, maybe for for the fires. That is one idea that I have. My second idea is this, which is a little rough and I'm, but if I look at ozone production in the fires, there's rapid ozone production in some of these fires, right? We'll fly through our downwind and there's 150 PPB of ozone, right? With 60, 70 PPB outside. It's real obvious when you're real close. And so that surprised me. I expected to see titration still at that point in the center of those dense plumes and I didn't see it. So, so what I did for th uh, these fires was I said, okay, what's the maximum delta ozone, delta CO observed in every fire? And that's what's in orange here. And then, I, then the blue here is basically, okay, at the same time when that maximum ozone was, usually the pan and the ozone, they rise lockstep in these fires. So they're produced really rapidly in that first two to three hours. So what's your delta pan, delta CO at that point? And so if I take that and that's what, and if I take that delta pan CO and I say, let me assume that now that pan somewhere downwind makes, contributes to ozone formation, and let's say it has an OP of 10 versus an OP of 20 versus an ozone production efficiency of 30. So that's what the blue shows here. So this is the delta ozone delta CO that would be later in that plume if that pan were to contribute to ozone production at an OP of 10, 20, or 30. And so, so sometimes that initial burst of ozone is actually really important for the total ozone produced. And sometimes the total ozone is probably potential, let's say, is all about the pan. And I don't know <laughs> exactly how to connect all these things. And I'm sitting on a weekend ozone paper because of it, because I'm just, I was hoping I could say something better. So, so I think with Chris, I think we can definitely go this, or we can make some estimate, we have how much pan in the Western US on average is from fires. What is that enhancement in the free troposphere? And how, and, and then we could assume some amount contributes to ozone. But this is another way that I've been trying to think about it. That doesn't answer your question, but that's, that's how I'm, I'm not exactly sure. No, that's, that's really helpful. And, you know, I also, this is a nice way of thinking about it, I think that, and it, of course, it, what the OPE is, is interesting, of course. And, and then there's the whole context, right, of the fact that in, at least when we had the big fires here last summer, it was very clear that a substantial fraction of the reactivity um, is from the VOCs from the fire. So- Same here. Yeah, so yeah. You, have this, yeah. you have this additional thing, which is we were mixing in the, the combustion NOx source from the cars and everything else with a much higher, um, organic, uh, independent of the pan itself, which of course is an additional source of NOx. There's, there's a lot of NOx. There's a lot. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of NOx that it, it, it encounters, right? So like, this is how I'm thinking about it now. I have to separate everything into the pieces. So, so like there's this initial ozone burst, right? Then that's what we sample during we can, right? And then those plumes travel at constant altitude and their pan, your delta pan, delta ozone over delta CO is, pretty constant and it seems like a lot of variability is added there as you mix air in and out of that, right? So if you didn't have that many samples, you could interpret this as something happening that was interesting. But in fact, I think it's a lot of randomness as the plumes stay at the same altitude. And then you have this like additional ozone production when the pan fueled by pan decomposition. And then like what happens when the plume mixes with urban air? That depends on whose urban air it is, right? Like, and what the mix what ratios and what mixtures end up happening and what time of day and like there's all sorts of things so um i just think that you know i'm i'm worried we're still pretty far away modeling wise from 
from actually predicting the ozone impacts of plumes. Unless yeah. for a given region, we can come up with some simplified way of thinking about it for that mixture, like something like approximate age of smoke in that mixture. Like maybe we should look at something simple like that. Um, what else? Well, we're at the five o'clock. Oh, you're hour. done. Sorry, I don't have the time. It's all covered with all your. No, faces. it's it's all good. But I think there was one more question. Did somebody have one last question? Okay, here. Uh, oh, wait. Who? Kevin? Is that you? Yes. Hey, Emily. Thanks for this uh, great talk. Um, one thing I wanted to comment, just uh, with respect to this last question. So we have Chris. One thing that we we are working to bring online is also bringing in tropomy. CO and tropomy ozone, which are in a tandem orbit with Chris. And so that's a column measurement combined with thermal infrared. So do you think the ability to understand the production, if we had better vertical resolution, uh, particularly when we think about the, 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 that sort of dropping side, right? So it's making its yeah. way down. Would that give us more insight into addressing that question before it hits the urban uh, receptor? I mean, are we still looking at Okay, so maybe before we hit the urban receptor, but like our, our, with trope only, I don't know very much about trope only, but are, I mean, are we still looking at um, like a degrees of freedom per signal for ozone in the boundary layer? That's going to be something like 0.3. So the like, I mean, of well, how much information are we going to get about the boundary layer? So the, the so what I could say is that in combination of Chris and trope only together, because one's a column measurement and one's a thermal infrared measurement, we should do a better job of isolating that boundary layer dynamics. Now, can we isolate it exactly? No, but to the extent to which the variability is going to be correlated vertically, uh, we would definitely get more than what we would get with Chris by itself. Yeah, so I think that the enhancement in these plumes, um, above background when they're dilute and they're sort of mixing with like, like for example, if a plume was coming from California or Oregon or something, and it's coming around the Rockies and it's hitting the front range, like when it's up by Walden, which is like, for those of you not familiar with this, there's like pronghorns running around. So there's, there's nothing up there when it's up by Walden and it's not influenced by the front range that those enhancements are probably on the order of six PPV. So ish, right? In that range, in that four to eight to 10 BBB, but, but not a lot. So, so if we could get that level of information, then I think, yeah, we could maybe understand at least how much ozone was there when the air mass comes into the urban area. So and I then we could try to pick apart the urban area a little bit, maybe using some other species in addition. So I think that's a, that's a, the question you're posing or the, that, that requirement is something that could be assessed because we could assess theoretically what we would expect to get from that combination. We could do that. We and then we could that. assess how much precision you would need and how many observations and how coherent that plume is. So, you know, is it just one place or is it larger scale? So we could sample multiple times. Yeah. then we can make a more definitive answer. But I would just say, before we get too uh, pessimistic, <laughs> we have more things up our sleeve that we can bring to the table. That's good, because I would love to get to ozone. I just feel like I'm like, oh, getting all, I can get really far with pan. And ammonia is super promising from Chris. I think that's going to be just as beautiful. But I'm still, I'm wrapping my head around the getting all the way to ozone. Uh, we're we're going to figure out a way to push you over the finish line, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, with, with that, um, I think we should, uh, we had over almost 60 po people on for your seminar at the, uh, today, Emily. So again, thanks because, you know, you really, this remote thing has some real advantages, right? It really does allow us to, to visit with a lot of people. And um, we thank you very much for coming today. And uh, everyone, we'll see you next week. Thanks for having me, everybody.